Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us on the Futurati podcast. Today, we're interviewing Eleanor Nell Watson, who is a researcher in emerging technologies and an early pioneer of computer vision technology. Nell, thanks for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you to researching emerging technologies? Yeah, I've, um, I've, I've had quite an interest in, in computer science for a while, and that took me into machine vision, where I've been working for almost the last 10 years, um, really since the advent of the uh, deep learning revolution, which really changed machine vision in a big way. Machine vision is all about helping machines to understand the world in new ways, to recognize objects and situations and perhaps even people's intentions. And I've done a little bit to contribute to that through uh, some image segmentation technology, which uh, we developed at a company that I co-founded, uh, which is now called Quanticore, which enables body measurement from um, just 2D cameras uh, very simple. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah and yeah. Um, since then, over the past few years, I've, as, as I've been called to, to share knowledge publicly about AI and the latest developments and what that means for our economy and our society, I've gotten gradually more and more concerned about technology, um, basically how how we can use it in ways that are likely to be more fair, um, which help to preserve the uh, dignity and independence of people around the world and to um, uh, mitigate any potential emerging inequalities. And so I've been doing a lot of work with uh, organizations such as the IEEE to create new standards and certifications for AI and how it's used, as well as the uh, organizations behind it. Yeah, we've, we've all heard a lot of the stories about how it can be used wrong. Um, I mean, that's what Hollywood focuses on and telling us how the world's going to end because AI or some new technology has gone totally off, off, uh, off, off the reservation. And, and so how do, uh, I, I mean, this is a much bigger question than we have time to answer, but it, it, we all in the back of our minds are wondering, well, how do we leverage the good parts of this technology without, um, without letting the bad parts seep in? Because there's always devious people that are trying to do the wrong thing. Absolutely. I think all technology is, is a dual-edged blade. It can be used to wound or it may be used like a scalpel to heal. And really it's all about the intention behind that technology as well as how potentially coercive it is, whether it's using um, force or manipulation or fraud in order to, uh, to get people to do things they otherwise might not wish to do. And I think that so long as we create good rules around how technology is to be developed and how it is to be deployed, we can mitigate some of the worst excesses of those, uh, of those possibilities of technology. I think we've done it before. We've, uh, we discovered just how dangerous CFCs were to our atmosphere, and we, we got together as a global uh, community in order to police that um, in quite a short period. And so I think we can do similar things with AI. It's... Um, it's a trickier problem because it's a little bit more distributed, um, but I think that with uh, with the right spirit behind it, we can harness the global community to help to um, protect against the worst excesses of these kinds of technologies. Yeah, so 
I could see that taking a couple of different forms. You've written a lot about transparency. You've developed this Coursera course on, on ethical technologies and, and becoming an ethical technologist. So if we could take each of those parts separately, what, it, what is it about transparency that especially mitigates some of the downside of this technology? And what, what exactly does that look like? Is it just publishing your source code or is there a set of boxes you have to check on some form? How do you see that unfolding? Absolutely. I, I see transparency often as, as the cornerstone of ethics, because really, if, if you don't understand a situation or can't understand a situation, then it, it's very difficult to, for example, hold people accountable or to um, understand how one's privacy might be being infringed or where there may be biases. Transparency is really, really the root. And they say that sunlight is the best disinfectant. And I think in many ways that is true. The more transparency that we can bring to any situation, generally speaking, better ethical outcomes are going to come from that. And so I think that, that whether it is greater transparency of an organizational process or a technical process or a decision-making process, um, those are all important aspects. And I think potentially some kind of vetting of, of algorithms and source code is welcome also. However, it may not be possible simply because that kind of intellectual property is often uh, some of the strongest value of tech companies and they understandably hold on to it um, very, uh, very jealously and, and carefully. And so... Perhaps it's, it may not be possible to take a peek at the source code per se, <coughs> but we can, we can create uh, endpoints where we can test an algorithm and probe it and send it um, benchmarked test inputs over time and see how those outputs emerge, whether there's any drift over time. Those kinds of ways can give us insights into how an, how an algorithm operates, which don't necessarily require us to drill down into it. And so I think there are, there are different, um, different comfort zones for both consumers as well as producers of technology. And I think that it's possible to find something that more or less works for everyone. So I wanted to push back a little bit on the topic of, of privacy. Um, because if, if we live in a radically transparent world that, and we know everything about everybody, um, that, then, then I know what your credit card numbers are, your bank account numbers, your passwords, and suddenly we lose our ability to own things. I mean, that's the extreme case. And so we have a need for a privacy bubble around every person, but it hasn't been defined legally or technologically or culturally and uh, so we're in we're in this gray zone of privacy and transparency, and um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on on how that dividing line should be crafted. Well, definitely there are trade offs between privacy and transparency, and both privacy and transparency can enhance trust. Um, for example. Um, the advent of uh, SSL or TLS, um, the, the little padlock in your browser whenever you do some e-commerce transactions or look at your online banking, that encryption, public key cryptography, it really enables our world of e-commerce because otherwise we'd be taking great risk in sharing our personal credit card information um, not just between the, the, the sender and the recipient, but potentially people who could intercept it along the way. And those kinds of technologies have enabled the modern world, and we wouldn't really be able to enjoy the world we have without them. And I think that there are technologies emerging now which have the potential to do something similar, but for privacy, um, not just of, of um, say, financial details, but... Uh, privacy of one's data and yet still enabling it to be used by machine learning, which is kind of the holy grail. 
So there's technologies such as homomorphic encryption, uh, zero knowledge proofs, and differential privacy. And in different ways, these technologies enable one to, to share not the full picture of one's private information, but enough of a general picture that that a description can be made of that information, which is then useful to, to machine learning algorithms. And that's, again, another way of having your cake and eating it as well. The, the training for the machine learning algorithm isn't going to be perfect, but it's probably good enough. And it means that uh, your very personal and private details can avoid needing to be shared. And I think that those technologies are now starting to move from the lab, from, from pure prototypes into um, publicly deployable technologies. And so over the next couple of years, we're going to start seeing more and more services uh, moving to embracing these kinds of privacy defending technologies. Okay, so it's it's not so much a matter of drilling down into the actual architecture of the neural network, because oftentimes it's not even really possible to parse what's happening on a node by node level, but just proving that you're meeting some kind of standard, even as you're treating a neural network as a black box or as a proprietary secret. Do I have that right? That's right. So it is rather difficult to understand neural networks, particularly because they are um, somewhat stochastic or random. Even the same input doesn't necessarily flow through the network the same way, um, especially as you have slight updates to the model or to the data going into it. However, there are also technologies that can help to, to map or debug these processes as well. Um, uh, Shapley algorithms, for example, can help us to understand uh, machine learning systems, can help us to, uh, to shine a spotlight into the black box of, of some of these mechanisms. We also have technologies emerging such as radioactive data, which is something uh, created by, uh, I think, Facebook research recently, where they they do a slight manipulation of data to create a kind of a steganographic signature. So, so um, a little bit of a, of a hidden signature that isn't really noticeable to humans and probably isn't even noticeable to machines unless you know what to look for. But just like um, taking a barium drink and then seeing uh, your guts being picked up by the, by the x-ray, because you've taken this, this isotope, we can do something similar with data, giving it this little slight uh, change, which enables that data then to be tracked. So you know a piece of data, where it came from, where it's going to, and if it shows up in a place where it shouldn't, that can help to set flags. So all of those techniques can help us to, to better understand machine learning, as well as the data that goes into it. Do you have any concerns that it will be possible to reverse engineer where the data com comes from? So it, hackers and, and people wanting to steal things have proven to be quite a bit more clever than I think many of us give them credit for or suspected that they would be. And it's, it's often possible to get information in ways that are just truly remarkable. So I like the idea of the radioactive data and tracing it with the data analog of barium. I still am sort of concerned, though, that there will be some way to back it out. Um, with, with something like a zero knowledge proof, it should be mathematically impossible to do that. But is it conceivable that some of these technologies are just not as secure as we think they are? Absolutely. Um, That's kind of in the world the of cryptography, nothing is can be guaranteed to be secure. And there's always some, some genius at, at DEF CON or some other um, workshop like that who has some angle on, on reconstructing something that, that people thought was, was impossible. I mean, there are techniques now that can get data off a completely air-gapped server, right? That's not even connected to a network. Right. But just by altering, say, the CPU temperature, um, slightly higher, slightly lower, that can send a password um, across 
uh, which which can be picked up by um, a forward looking IR sensor and it gets sent one one uh, bit at a time. Uh, nothing is securable truly, but you know, so long as we are investing in the arms race, um, we can we can help to to protect um, against more kind of um, bedroom uh, programmers, I suppose. And even to this day, you know, a lot of public key encryption remains secure. It has done for decades, uh, and so I think that the, there's there's reason to be somewhat hopeful that we can protect our systems going into the future. Yeah, I find that people underestimating the various ways that you can get information into or out of a system is a pretty persistent roadblock in thinking clearly about the dangers of emerging technologies. I, I remember giving a talk on AI safety once and a, a Google engineer who was just a brilliant guy came back saying, well, you should just air gap the computers. And then my very next slide was talking about how you could vary the temperature on the CPU and you could get information in, into or out of it, or you could guess passwords based on the infer the interference in finger patterns and the Wi-Fi signal as it comes. There's like this flashing shadows on the wall. You can figure this stuff out. And, and people just, people underestimate that even when you're only dealing with human intelligences, with, in with, entities that basically reason in a way similar to the way that you reason and are approximately on the same scale. And that's not even considering what an algorithm might come up with or um, an intelligence far greater than your own would. And so I guess in keeping with that theme, you've written that artificial intelligence will be as disruptive in this century as electricity was in the prior century. So what are the major near term developments that you think will be most disruptive? In essence, mach machine learning is all about correlations. Some correlations are simple. You know, one half of our face tends to look like a mirror of the other. People with big hands also tend to have big feet. Those are kind of no brainers, but often there are correlations between things that, that we cannot necessarily understand on a cognitive level, but we might have some kind of a gut instinct about, some kind of an intuition. But we can't really express why we have that hunch. But machines can actually pinpoint these things often a lot better than we can. They are very powerful um, at making intuitive leaps. And I think that this is this is what's going to be so so important now and in the future is that machines can make sense of extremely chaotic situations and scenarios things that that we think are are far too complex for for us to deal with for example uh, we just saw very recently the, the research out of deepmind where they've um, uncovered ways of turning a a string of genes into uh, into a, a mappable, dockable protein, essentially, which seems absolutely bizarre. But this is this is indicative of of how machines can help us to deal with extremely complex and chaotic situations. And this means that everything from biology to society itself things that we consider very complex, uh, multivariate, um, rather difficult to uh, bound and understand, all of these systems can now be understood by machines. And if they can be understood, then they can be predicted, they can be interpreted, they can be potentially manipulated. And if we can manipulate uh, a string of genes into a protein, we can probably manipulate uh, human society or even human individuals as well in different ways. And so I think that these technologies are going to be absolutely transformative to our personal and professional lives. And that's why it's so important that we, that we employ them in the, in the way that is, is most safe and most ethical, particularly as the capabilities, as you say, are going to eclipse our own and in many ways already have. Yeah, in, in 2030, I always think about the scenario that we can we can all relate to this idea of, of getting into a car that drives itself. And rather than just punching in commands into uh, kind of a dumb terminal on front, 
in the front of the car, we, we will actually be talking back and forth to this vehicle. And, and the vehicle then will kind of draw out, uh, do you want to stop for coffee? Do you want to, yeah, do you want to pick up your friends or, um, is that a dog you have in the back seat with you? And, um, do you want to put down some protection down on the back seat so it doesn't mess things up? Or, you know, there's all kinds of issues that come up when you're driving somewhere. And so having a conversation like that gets into lots of aspects of privacy and everything. But, but I always, that's something that we can relate to really well. But um, I, I'm wondering if you have in the back of your mind some idea of how how AI is going to be used 10 years from now that nobody's thinking about right at the moment. Definitely we are we're about to have several Sputnik moments I feel in AI over the next say say 12 months or so 12 to 18 months perhaps. Similar with um with the announcement from DeepMind, which is maybe not for the general public so much, but for the scientific community, that's a Sputnik moment because nobody imagined that uh, protein modeling would be something that uh, that could be a solved problem anytime soon. I think that today we're getting used to the idea of talking to um, our AI assistants on our phones and uh home devices and asking, you know, what the weather is going to be like tomorrow or, you know, uh, who, who won the, 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 the sports match. But we're not really expecting to be having a, a meaningful conversation with these kinds of bots yet. And yet I think in the next year to t- uh, year to two years, we will. Um, now that the cat is out of the bag with regards to attention-focused neural networks or these, these transformers, uh, such as GPT-3. Essentially, 10 years ago with, with deep learning, we discovered if we have lots of layers and we throw lots of data at a problem, we get unreasonably effective outcomes. And now we're discovering that having massive models and investing a lot of time and resources into creating them, again, gives a disproportionate return on investment. And so now we're going to see all kinds of organizations dumping money into these massive models, which are going to be orders of magnitude more powerful. And suddenly AI is going to reach a a discontinuity in its capabilities. And people are going to be freaked out a lot by the capabilities of AI, where suddenly it is feasible to have your AI, quote unquote, secretary, um, handle some uh, some minor social task, like ringing someone up and asking them if they want to uh, come to a party and then booking the table and all of that stuff seamlessly for us. Uh, I think that's going to freak a lot of people out because, you know, a lot of typical middle and lower middle class tasks are are those those kinds of of problems, and that's going to again threaten uh, a lot of occupations essentially, as well as as well as bring this new element into our social sphere. Because if we're asking our AI butler to handle something on our behalf, we don't want that representative of ourselves to end up embarrassing us, right? To end up doing some sort of gauche faux pas that that makes us look bad. And so it's going to be very important then to start socializing AI, to provide feedback like we do for children or pets, um, kind of a that was good or that was not so good and uh, with a very strong need for them to understand different cultural expectations and different situational expectations. What might be appropriate at a wedding could not be appropriate at a funeral and vice versa. Those kinds of of, um, opportunities for learning are going to be very important between now and 2030. So 
how do you see the training process for that workout? I, I know that you're also involved in a separate project to build, is it an open source data set for solving ethical problems? Do I have that right? Haven't you built something kind of like that? Well, yes, something along those lines. So I have a little project called ethicsnet.org, which is uh, crowdsourcing examples of behavioral norms. So kind of the, the mother of ethics. It's not about right and wrong per se, but about um, what is socially preferable or dispreferable. So this is what given humans a, expect. A yeah. certain situation. Yes, exactly. Um, so just as, as we don't expect a six-year-old child to know right from wrong exactly, but we can still give feedback and say, if you're in a quiet place like a church or a museum, try and be quiet yourself. Simple kindergarten things. It's nice to share. Try not to make a mess, those kinds of things. So if we can begin to teach machines those very simple rules, then they are more likely to be a welcome social presence because that's what we have. We, we now have, for the first time, uh, a new social presence. And I think that you know a lot of people will be uncomfortable and will feel that AI should be uh, seen and not heard, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, just before um, we started today, uh, Trent and I were having this discussion about uh, um, fake people and uh, the idea of us being able to create um, uh, fake videos and more specifically fake testimonials. Um, mm. Lots of the alternative health world uh, relies on testimonials from people to sell their products. And uh, it doesn't seem uh, like a very big stretch to imagine us creating uh, all these fake testimonials that are very, very convincing. And, um, and it, it, you know, when you start thinking through that, there's, there's not a lot of checks and balances that seem logical for protecting us from that. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? That is absolutely a huge issue. Uh, and, it, and it's contributing to the epistemic crisis in our society. That's kind of not knowing what you know or not knowing what to believe in, right? This sort of um, hypernormality where all kinds of false information is given to us, which seems pretty plausible, whether that's created by, um, you know, people getting paid 20 cents to make a false review, or whether that's created by bots or some hybrid combination. And of course, now machines can generate uh, very believable human faces, bodies, etc. We're moving towards a video now, which can be created on demand. So for example, um, we could speak just, just like I'm speaking right now, but I could appear to be someone uh, of a different age, gender, ethnicity, etc., and maybe even I'm speaking Portuguese or something instead. All of it done live, real time, on the fly. That's where technology is right now. And so it's getting harder to to know what to believe. And mercifully, there are some techniques out there that can pinpoint. Uh, where something might have been manipulated. But again, it's an arms race, right? There will always be better and better um, technology at, at faking the creation of content. And this can actually be used potentially in a malicious way, whereby you can shadow ban people. So you can exclude them from a conversation in such a way that they think they're still having a conversation with their peers. It's just that all of their peers are actually bots, right? So the community doesn't actually exist. People aren't actually talking to each other. They've just all been kind of paired off into a corner to chat with, with bots, trained to uh, generate content in a way that, that members of their community would. And so these kinds of techniques, um, some of the big tech companies essentially have patents on these kinds of techniques already, um, which I think is, is a bit of a worrying trend for, for the future because these kinds of abuses um, could well be perpetrated by, by different actors out there. 
that seems like a a strange variant on Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, where it's not so much that you're sucked into a virtual reality. It's just that you think you're engaging with actual people and having meaningful conversations, and it's just a bunch of neural networks on a server somewhere that's feeding you up a, a slushy of the internet. That it, you know, it, it's trained on all this Twitter data, and it's just feeding it back to you. You have no idea that you're just talking into the void. Exactly, exactly. And and the thing is that then you can have nominal freedom of speech, right? But actually, the freedom of speech is is meaningless because freedom of reach has been curtailed. And I think that that freedom of reach is actually going to be an even bigger issue in the years to come. Is there a, a way to operate with, I, I guess I'm an American, so you're, you're in the UK, so it's maybe a little different. But here we have the First Amendment. Do you think there's a way to operate within the existing constitutional framework to guarantee a right of that kind? Or is it going to require an entirely different way of conceptualizing these rights and defending them? I would posit that the First Amendment should be kept as it is, um, and that in fact it should be extended so that it's not just about the government uh, curtailing your speech, but that it's you know you have a you have a right to to express yourself um, not just in a book, which I believe is constitutionally protected, but that you have a right to to express yourself in other more modern forms of media. I think that's that's going to be essential uh, in in the years to come in order to uh, to preserve liberty across society. So it's clear that you take the impacts of technology very seriously and the ethics around it pretty seriously. So I, I was hoping we could get sort of philosophical for a moment and talk about your approach to understanding the ethics and the impacts of these technologies. So would you consider yourself more of a consequentialist or a deontologist with respect to ethics? Uh... I, I consider myself um, kind of a kit basher, a mashup. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, you know, as a, a deontological uh, approach of, you know, something is categorically wrong and therefore you shouldn't do it is something that's nice to shoot for, but isn't always compatible with reality or with edge case situations, you know, um, sometimes and, and, you can't say that something is an absolute wrong if if uh, if, if following the, the the letter of the law precisely leads to some sort of horrible outcome happening somewhere else. At the same time, research tells us that people or organizations or other agents that don't follow a deontological approach that are purely utilitarian or consequentialist are very hard to trust. People don't tend to trust um, actors that might decide uh, it's too expensive to do the right thing, and so we're going to uh, we're going to uh, give you the short end of the stick this time. And so it's very important that that we uphold um, any uh, any categorical rules as far as is possible, because it's only through doing that that we can ensure uh, social trust is is maintained. Yeah, we've. Um, I want to take this a little bit different direction, but have um, uh, we? We've had several discussions around quantum computing, and quantum computing is um, one of the big emerging technologies. But uh, for the most part, we don't have any good examples of what it's going to be used for in the future, um, other than breaking encryption. Uh, so, do you have some idea of practical uses that are right around the corner? And is something like a quantum AI something that we need to, uh, uh, the ultimate boogeyman that'll be haunting us in the future? Well, it's possible. Uh, quantum computing does indeed have, have a lot of potential to it, but it, it keeps having a strange problem, which is that Classical algorithms just get better and better. So it's not just that that algorithms are getting more sophisticated over time or that compute is increasing all the time. Both of those are true, but actually we get more and more efficient at how we make algorithms over time, um, following a similar kind of, of curve, um, somewhat analogous to, to, to Moore's law. And 
essentially this means that classical algorithms can do things faster or at least equivalent to uh, quantum techniques all the time. <laughs> and so actually quantum, quantum computers, um, the development of them is always like, yes, finally we have, we have some little uh, use case within uh, the world of finance, for example, Oh, drat! No, some new classical al algorithms come out that can do it way, way cheaper and possibly faster. <laughs> and that's that's always the, the the eternal problem in in quantum computing. But I think that um, elements of elements of bringing the quantum world into machine learning is going to be very powerful. So I myself, I'm a co-author of of a paper on uh, quantum machine learning. And that uses techniques essentially, essentially using machine learning to simulate quantum physics and then using that simulation to improve other systems, other physical systems such as uh, physics models, such as biological systems, um, or actually improving machine learning systems. So essentially, this could help to create kind of a self-improving AI, at least to, to a limited degree. So I think there's, there's a lot of room for, for using these kinds of approaches, which um, might have a few surprises for people. Uh, in terms of sudden advancement and capabilities that people weren't expecting. So I have never heard of that application of quantum machine learning specifically to a recursively self-improving AI. Do you worry that those AIs will run into any of the standard problems that come with trying to do that through classical algorithms? It's a, it's a possibility. Um, but I, I think that so, some of the techniques that, that we've been looking at, um, as far as I can tell, they appear to be closer to how the actual human or other um, mammalian brains function. And but because typical artificial neural networks are a rather crude uh, in the, the the kind of the activation function, so so basically the um, the mathematical rules that enable one neuron to connect to another and so forth, but actually by by creating a simulation of the physical properties uh, of neurons, also taking into effect, uh, into account their uh, their quantum thermodynamic effects, actually then we can use that simulation of how we think the brain operates to advance ML. And so those kinds of techniques potentially might, again, lead to another uh, surprising discontinuity and capability. So we, I, I published um, the, the, the paper. I've, I, it hasn't even been, been in a journal yet. It, it's, only, it's only come out the last uh, few weeks, but uh, the code is available. So. Uh, if folks out there are curious, um, you can uh, download it and have a play. It's on my website at nellwatson.com forward slash publications. So that sounds like you're trying to use standard neural networks to simulate quantum mechanical systems as a means to develop neuromorphic AI. Exactly. But it's very complicated. I'll have to, I'll have to get the code and mess around <laughs> with it. So I... I get a lot of different answers when I ask about the near-term applications of quantum machine learning. So besides simulating quantum mechanical systems, what else do you think that they might be used for? Well, I think any, uh, almost any kind of physical system uh, or, or system which can be abstracted uh, in a physical manner or thermodynamic manner can be improved by these technologies. So... You can use the technology to, to simulate those systems, but also to potentially optimize them, right? So to make a, a, uh, a technique faster or more capable or to improve the efficiency of something in different ways. 
So I think the, the, the possibilities are almost unbounded, uh, except by our imagination. So uh, m- moving into the way you're thinking about things and training um, young people today to move into, I, I always think in terms of the half-life of uh, an education, uh, how valuable are these skills for your learning, um, all this information. And and we're moving into a very fast-moving world here. And, and so uh, teaching concrete skills, um, different formulas and algorithms and things like that, um, a year later, they're all uh, ancient history. Uh, so in your mind, what's the best way to uh, kind of educate a young mind to uh, jump on this fast moving train and keep up with every, all the changes ahead? That's a great question. I think it's clear that uh, the idea of of going to college and learning a trade and then you use that your whole life exclusively, um, I think that's going out the window. I think it's very clear that people will be surfing between different careers or at least different majors, if you will, um, in their careers as technology changes, as new waves arrive. And continuing professional development is going to be very important, as are creating new ways of of training people. And I think that that there are tremendous unexploited opportunities with regards to to training and education. Because if we can uh, create a shorter learning loop, then we can help people to train much more efficiently and much more quickly. So essentially, a, a learning loop is when you you take an action and you see the the result of it, right? And if you see the result immediately, it's a lot easier to adjust what you're doing. So think of when you are at the at the arcade and they have that that basketball game, right? Where you have to throw the basketball into the basket and it it lights up every time that, that the ball goes through. Uh, you you get very direct and fast feedback, and so you can adjust your throw until you are consistently getting them uh, in the sweet spot. Typically, a lot of our learning involves re- receiving some some instruction, and then you know a semester later trying to regurgitate that, and then you get you get a mark like a month after that, right? And that's that's not very helpful. So. If we can speed up that learning loop, we can transform education and and training as well and enable a lot more people to very quickly master skills. Another example might be things like uh, VR games, such as uh, Beat Saber, right? And, you know, you get very, very quick feedback uh, regarding your movements and whether you, you did them correctly or not. And imagine if we had something like that, but for um, you know, skilled trades or uh, working in a kitchen or uh, in construction or you know, any kind of uh, environment, medical training, of course. And I think that, that these kinds of developments are, are likely to transform how training happens in, in the coming years. And I think that's going to be increasingly important as many different people in our society uh, struggle to to find some way to to reinvent themselves for uh, some new career or other, or a new way of doing the same kind of career, such as uh, through distance means. So in the 10 or so minutes that we have left, I want to go into some kind of unusual territory. And I want to talk about this piece you published called a bootstrap process for life and cognition. And Mm -hmm. in it, you stipulate that certain kinds of energy dissipating processes like life might be transforming the universe because they actually fine tune local physical constants in such a way that uh, these processes 
and more complicated variants of them become easier. And you stipulate that this might have something to do with the emission of dark energy. So this sort of blew my mind when I read it. And I, I realized that there were just lots of implications in various parts of philosophy and and science. So I, th I hoped we could start by just getting clear on what some of these words mean, beginning with energy dissipation. So what is it, what is special about the way that I dissipate energy as against a rock that's warmed in the sun and then radiates heat afterwards? Like why, why is it special when I do it? Right, exactly. So essentially our, our universe from, from the very start of the universe up until more recent history, it's been a process of different matter within the universe, taking in energy and then uh, being affected by energy and then radiating that energy out again, typically, typically in the form of heat. So we start with physical processes and then chemical processes and then we get into biological processes. And each of those steps along the way involves uh, more energy passing through a, a given mass of matter and then radiating through it. And we, we see something similar within life itself as life gets more complicated. Um, we, have, we have very, very simple signal celled organisms which dissipate more energy than, than rocks. But then we have eukaryotes, right? The little um, single-celled organisms that have uh, a little bit more, more complexity to them. And then cold-blooded life, and then warm-blooded life, and then um, mammalian brains, which have emotion and social bonding, etc. And then we come to the human brain with its 86 billion neurons or so, which was, until recently, the most dissipative object in the known universe. But our own human brains have been surpassed in the last half century or so by the microchip, which is now the most dissipative uh, piece of matter, atom for atom, in the known universe by far. And so it seems as if we are, we are ourselves part of a bootstrap process, which is taking the universe into ever greater and greater um, ability to, to dissipate energy for some strange reason, but it, that seems to, to be the pattern of the universe. And so this is an, an area of active research for me at the moment, and I'll be researching it for another few years, I think, before I, I publish any, any uh, real thoughts on it. But I, I posit that actually this, this greater dissipation over time may in fact be why, why the universe is expanding. And in fact, why the the rate of expansion of the universe seems to be increasing over time because uh, as more opportunities for life arrive in different parts of the universe and that life becomes more, uh, more complex, I posit that life itself is actually generating dark energy and thereby blowing up the universe at an ever greater rate. Yeah. So could we talk a little bit about the observations that lead you that have led you down this path? So there's the expansion of the universe in that blog post. You talk a little bit about cosmic filaments and uh, I guess the sort of empty zone around the Milky Way to walk through the empirical observations that motivate the development of this hypothesis. Yes. Well, you know, if we look at, at the at the universe at a very grand scale, there are voids. There are some parts of the universe that are almost empty, or at least have have a far greater, uh, far uh, s smaller amount of mass within a given uh, radius than than other parts of the universe. And this is a mystery. We don't really know 
why that is, although there are a few theories. But I, I posit actually that, that galactic clusters that have more concentration of life or other dissipative uh, processes going on within them are, all things being equal, more likely to create voids around them, right? And I, I think that there's probably a, a falsifiable hypothesis whereby if you can find parts of the universe that have been sterilized by uh, gamma ray bursts, et cetera, then those parts of the universe should have less expansion because whatever life-giving processes were in them um, would presumably have been snuffed out. And so I'm very interested in uh, trying to see if, if there's enough data out there already that we can chew on uh, to see if that, that pattern actually matches or not. So could you see the development of life in the universe by just sending something the size of the moon, like a microchip the size of the moon that's dissipating energy all the time to one of these sterilized galaxies and begin the process of changing the local constant such that other dissipative processes are, are more likely to arise? In theory, I think um, that would be a very interesting experiment. <laughs> so could you talk a little bit about the mechanism that would drive this? So you said possibly we emit dark energy. I'm still not really clear on how that changes the fine tuning of the local constants. Like what, what is the relationship between those two things? Mm, right. So. Well, I, mean, I guess how so would you we, know? Uh, like how would you know that dark energy is being emitted? Right. So yes, that's that's another that that's another uh, mystery about the universe that, that's only come to light in the last few years, is that the the fine structure con constant of the universe, basically the, um, the 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 fine balance between different physical properties, um, such as uh, the the weight of an electron, so to speak. Um, those were assumed to be, you know, uniform uh, across the whole universe. Uh, and we found that they're not, they're, they're not uniform. They are uh, non-isotropic, they vary. And that means that essentially how physics itself operates may be different in different galaxies or in different corners of the universe. And Again, I, I posit that the emergence of life may actually alter the, the fine structure con uh, constant. So perhaps life itself, just as, as biological plants can break down rocks into soil, which help to support life, so the life of that plant and then um, other elements in that ecosystem, I suspect that something similar might be happening with life itself altering the fine structure constant. The exact mechanism, I'm not sure, uh, but I, I suspect it might have something to do with uh, entropic gravity. But uh, it would be tricky to explain that verbally. But I, I really recommend that people um, have a look at uh, entropic gravity and uh, a few of the other um, topics that I've, I've mentioned. And uh, I think this is, this is one of the most intriguing mysteries of the universe as to uh, why this universe that we thought was pretty much uniform is not. It's, it's bubbly and uh, varying, and we don't really know why. Well, fantastic. I think that's a, a great note to end on. Thanks so much for joining us today, Nell. This has been stimulating and very interesting. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us and we wish you the best on your research and we, we hope to hear a lot more about you in the future. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. All right. Thank you.